Claire, maybe I can come to you first. I was talking earlier to Toby Perkins from the Labour Party, the front bencher, um, about this story front page of the Sunday Times today, 20 out of 24 Russell Group universities sticking with online learning. Morning. Yes, I, I, I've seen the article and obviously this is something that uh, both students have talked to us about, but also universities over the course of the, the last 18 months. I think the key piece of advice I would give students, and I do when I speak to them on a regular basis, is to ask questions because it's not a single model here. Um, there are some very large lectures where they're looking to have online, but also on demand. And we do that with a lot of our big events and actually students uh, value that on-demand digital learning. But I know many universities, and I was down in Exeter University just last week, are looking to do the seminars, the, the, the small tutor groups, very much face-to-face. -face. And so looking as much as possible to do face-to-face -face for some of those things that students really value face-to-face. -face. So my key piece of advice for students and their parents would be ask, because it will be different, different institutions, but also different subjects that require different elements of learning. But if you if you have your heart set on going to a particular university and then you ask the question that you're telling um, teenagers to ask and the answer comes back, we're sticking with online, surely then you deserve a refund or to think that maybe you want to go to a different university? There are very few universities. In fact, I, I you know, I'd fail to name a single one where everything is going to be online. And most universities are looking not just into the learning experience to get back to elements of face to face, but also the sporting facilities, the library facilities that that you go to university to have that experience as well. So I know the Office for Students is the English regulator. You know, it's going to be watching for for this as we go into the autumn term. But every university I've spoken to has still an element of face to face um, and actually invested considerable amounts in terms of their digital online experience. The key thing is, is it a quality digital experience? And I think that's the key thing that, that students just need to be attuned and to. And certainly most students who experienced online learning last year said it was definitely inferior. Even Toby Perkins said it was inferior. And just picking up on your point of um, which universities, yes, some are saying they're going to do blended. Warwick, Nottingham and Manchester say they're going to do blended. But uh, UCL in London, uh, London School of Economics, Imperial, Cardiff, Leeds, Glasgow and Edinburgh all saying that lectures will continue to be held online. Um, I just want to bring in um, Justin Greening. Justin Greening, you have you know, sat in the, 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 the hot seat as Education Secretary, I mean, mercifully for you, not in a pandemic. But what's your reaction to these universities saying they're going to continue to do online remote learning? Well, I think, as Claire says, in the end, it's down to the quality of teaching that we want students to have. And a lot of universities put investment resources into online learning and actually found ways to deliver it to students far more effectively, perhaps, than they might have imagined at the beginning of the pandemic. A lot of the chancellors I to are now really interested in how they find the best of both worlds, combining face-to-face, um, in-person teaching where that can be hugely effective, um, often, as Claire says, in smaller classes, but actually recognising that for some students in particular, those massive lecture theatres that I remember sitting in where there's literally 200 of you and you know, right at the front, a, a, lecture, a lecturer, all feels a bit old-fashioned in many respects and that there may be other opportunities, different ways to deliver that learning. But ultimately, it is about quality. I think the other reflection I'd have, Daisy, on all of this is, again, if you are a government that has levelling up as your key strategy, then actually for commuter students, for more mature students, for, for some of those students who aren't teenagers, as we tend to think of all students, but actually have very busy other lives, other responsibilities, a more blended learning approach is one of the ways they can actually find doing higher education more accessible. So, I don't think it's quite as straightforward as saying all online or all face-to-face. -face. I think we are going to move into a more hybrid, blended learning world. I think that's probably a good thing. The key is for universities to make sure it works in the student's best interest. And then, of course, alongside all of that is the fact that university is much, much more than just learning. It, it's about the rest of that experience you have. And it is important that universities don't just do the lectures, do the seminars, do the degree, but they provide that much wider student experience that really does develop people and makes them career ready for the jobs that 
going to want to get when they finally graduate. I think that I think that's the point where people are looking at the situation are thinking the students aren't being treated fairly and aren't being treated as customers, which really they are. They're paying enormously uh, with you know, paying for their fees and some of them for their accommodation and aren't getting value for money. And that perhaps this um, you know, the, the tail's wagging the dog rather than the other way around. But I take your point about upskilling um, and, and leveling up and perhaps this being a way of more people accessing higher education, which certainly um, would be helpful. Um, Roger, I believe we've we've got you on. On the line. Um, talk to me about this period. Obviously, we're just a few days out from um, A level um, and GCSEs next week um, coming out, and this has been another extraordinary year. It has, and understandably, there will be a great deal of anxiety about how this is going to play out. Um, one, one comment, I, I, a couple of comments to make about this sort of situation. It is a very difficult situation, and the, the first comment would be that to try and provide, you know, offer some reassurance to students. Um, I think, for example, the risk, we're likely to see inflation, uh, significant inflation. And would you and agree, sorry to interrupt, but would, would you agree sure. with predictions saying 10% inflation at least? And what we mean by that is grades being 10% higher than, than, exactly. than, than they would have been or they would have been pre-pandemic or last year? Yes, and just to explain that, I 10% more people getting those grades. So in that sense, the grades are lowering in terms of the standard, as it were, to achieve a grade. Um, but more people are getting the grades um, and, 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 and at a scale of around 10 percent. Uh, that seems very plausible. And, and the two, th two things to make is that first thing to say about that is, while that has real consequences long term for education and it may cause, you know, just as this year's students felt they may be disadvantaged by the inflation last year, the inflation this year may again disadvantage students next year. But the main use of these qualifications is to select candidates from this year group to go to university. Yeah, we've talked about A levels. Yep, that's what they're mainly used for. And in that sense, inflation really doesn't matter because they're all on a, on on the in the same boat there. So, and and I think there've been some comments that employers won't treat these grades as seriously. I don't think that's a, a big risk for students. I think employers. But you say they're all in the same that. boat, but the boat, as in the university boat, hasn't got any bigger. There aren't any more places, so no. there are going to be too many kids chasing too few places at universities. Yes, well, of course, that is always true. Every year, there are more kids wanting to go to university than, than get places. Uh, and it's not. It's not also not quite true that you can't make the boat bigger. And we saw the boat was made bigger last year. And I think there are efforts again this year, uh, you know, to to say, look, we you know we are having difficulty making accurate discrimination of as you know accurate selection choices to to tell the difference between candidates who should go to university and who shouldn't. So you know, the inflation is in effect. You might say it's it's erring on the side of. Of, of the student and saying, well, you know, uh, we will take more of you um, and, and, and give more of you higher grades. The universities, I think this year, will try, try and exercise a bit more control. Obviously, last year's events came about through a pretty chaotic process uh, um, and was not, you know, wasn't planned for. Uh, this year, there's been a bit more of a chance, not, you know, still it, the universities are having to deal with a huge amount of uncertainty, as are students. Um, but they, at least they have had some sense of what might happen and, and have been able to take some steps to uh, to deal with that uncertainty. So, Roger, I don't want to go over past miseries too much, but just to, <laughs> just, just to remind people that you um, you, know, you quit your job um, after the, the grading difficulties, yeah. let's say, last year. Your successor has had a year to avoid the pitfalls that um, you found yourself in. Have they done that? Well, they've avoided the pitfalls of last year, which was, uh, you know, reliance on an algorithm to prevent grade inflation in a situation where, you know, the fact, I mean, you know, on the one hand, you could say, well, algorithms, they're not, you know, it's pretty good at predicting uh, results. But unfortunately, it, that's not that's not good enough. You know, it, the, the, the the degree of error in which an inevitable degree of error and then and the idea that people would simply accept that as part of life proved to be very wide of the mark. And, uh, you know, and this is not a, a criticism of any one government. All four governments in the United Kingdom made the same judgment. They thought, well, people will just accept that. And they didn't. And we had to, have, then, in, you know, in a very chaotic last minute of scramble, change the approach and allow a significant amount of inflation. Um, this year, you know, we, there, is, there is not the same attempt, as it were, to sort of prevent um, uh, you know, to restrict inflation to the same degree, recognising that Again, we have a system that is simply not as reliable and as legitimate as a, as a you know, standard exam that everyone takes in the same situation and provides a fair basis 
you know, a consistent basis for saying, well, OK, these kids get to go to those universities and these kids don't. But, but Claire, Claire yeah. Marchant, isn't the the risk we're running, again, is that kids are going to end up... So I keep saying kids, but I mean, you know, anyone of any age who's going to university, as, as Justine did, point. Did, did point out, but, you know, that, that, that undergraduates might end up starting university courses that they're actually not equipped to do. I, I think um, that is a risk, but I, I'm really confident that all the universities I speak to and interact with on a daily and weekly basis are doing all sorts of catch up um, where it's appropriate. Uh, they are very aware of the experience that these young people, particularly young people, have been through over the course of the last 18 months. And I, and I would you know, reinforce what Roger says, that they, universities have been super flexible last year and will continue to this year. We are expecting record numbers to, of students to get their first choice this year um, because of that flexibility. And we've also still got a very dynamic clearing set of courses. So, you know, nearly 30,000 courses, not courses, not places, um, that students, if it doesn't go that, you know, exactly as they want on Tuesday, they've got those courses to choose from, albeit, you know, I would advise them start prepare for your you know, a plan B now. So you have a little bit of research in the bag by the time it comes to Tuesday morning. Justine Greening, um, looking at the wider picture, never, whatever the expression is, you know, never waste a crisis. But if you look at this crisis, this pandemic and, and the challenges it's thrown up, and you've already mentioned some of the changes that might happen for the better um, as a result of using more technology for you know higher education or so on. But is this an opportunity to rip up uh, the rule book, rip up the textbook and really push some major changes throughout education? I mean, you know, primary, secondary um, and uh, universities and colleges. Absolutely. And we're not going to see levelling up and equality opportunity happen unless we work right the way through from even before schooling days into early years and have a, a comprehensive plan that makes sure we don't have gaps open up at every single stage of a young person's life. Give and me some practical ideas, stuff. things that you want Gavin Williamson to do. So first of all, I think you need to recognise that different places in the country have different educational challenges. I introduced something called opportunity areas whilst I was at the DfE. They have been successful there in 12 different places at the moment, working on very different challenges that these different communities have. I would introduce a whole lot more of those. I would have an increased focus as well, not just on academics, but beyond that, we know when you talk to employers across the country that really what makes for a successful career isn't so much the academics that a person has, but it's their aptitude to work, it's their ability to work in teams, it's their resilience, it's all sorts of things. Actually, when you look at what we are making sure children and young people learn in schools, that happens, if you like, as a side effort by much hard work from many teachers but there isn't really a full strategy, I think, at all in place to make sure it happens consistently. That's something that I was very focused on looking at at the DfE. Justine, do you so think there is, sorry do. to interrupt, do you think there is this addiction to exams that we need to wean ourselves off, as Kevin Collins I, said? I think yes, and I think that academic attainment is vitally important, but it's only part of the picture of what makes for a successful person that can fulfil their potential. And so we can't leave on one side the fact that it is those other skill sets I've just talked about. It is making sure that young people know the different opportunities that are available to them because businesses can come into schools and talk about careers. It's important that they get the right kind of mentoring and advice so that they can work out how to use the talents they've got and then how to get to those opportunities that they're learning about whilst they grow up. All of those planks have to be in place if we're really going to make the most of the potential that Britain has got. And, of course, we've come out of the pandemic with some very big bills to pay, and we're not going to be able to pay them off if we continue to be a country where probably about a third of people can reach their potential, but the other two-thirds don't. And, and, and so that requires a comprehensive long-term plan, and, and that's really what Sir Kevin Collins was suggesting and, and making a, a fist of... of setting out how you might go and do that. And Claire Marchant, um, is there one radical change you'd like to see at UCAS? Would you like to see GCSEs and A-levels dropped and it replaced with something else? I think the biggest radical change for me would be to put the likes of apprenticeships, um, Justine mentioned there, you know, 
the, the parity for everybody, not just the 40 plus percent that come through UCAS for an undergraduate degree. So really offering the likes of apprenticeships and employment alongside traditional three undergraduate degrees. That for me would be a real step change for students. But I also think the timeliness of information, advice and guidance. You know, we know that students as young as year six in primary make choices about their future. So I th also think there's some timeliness. So my two big things would be, you know, parity of options and timeliness of some of those careers advice. And finally, Roger Taylor, is Gavin Williamson the man for the job? Um, do you know what? It's, it isn't about Gavin Williamson. Um, and, you know, if you take 2020, he made the same mistakes everyone else made. And you know, there's a lot of support for what he's trying to do. But I do want to say I very much agree with what Justine was saying, what Kevin Collins was saying. But I want to just caveat it a, a bit. You know, we want uh, this addiction to exams is, is perhaps at its worst in the accountability regime. And we want education to focus on giving students, young people, kids the, the, what they need to progress in life. Yep. And if you look at what employers are doing now, they're, and the universities even are starting to do this, they are turning to their own mechanisms of assessment. Yep. And those mechanisms, it's not, they don't, it's not that they don't like exams. Yep. They use loads of exams. They, they get kids to sit down and do tests. They want to find out if they can do maths. They want to know if they can read and write well. They do use tests, but they use other things as well. And this is a real risk because if, 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 if schools and universities aren't giving their, their customers, as you put it, but the, the, the people who are there to learn, if they're not giving them the evidence they need to get their jobs and get their opportunities in life, they're letting them down. And at the moment, education, the whole system is not geared enough to, around the question of what do you need to show somebody that you, to both find the opportunities in life and to show that you've got the skills to pursue those opportunities. And uh, that, that for me, is the, is, the, is, the, is the crux of it and the thing that we, 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 there's a huge amount we could do to improve that. Mm -hmm.